Hi everyone, my name is Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In this video, I will cover the anatomy of the ear and pathologies affecting the ear. Let's start with the anatomy. The ear is a unique organ in the body that allows us to hear, while also being partly responsible for our sense of balance. The ear can be divided into three parts external, middle, and inner ear. The external ear can be further divided into two parts, the auricle or pinna, which is the visible part of the ear, and the external auditory meatus, which is the part of the ear canal lateral to the eardrum or tympanic membrane. The auricle's funnel shape helps to capture and direct sound waves to the eardrum. The auricle is mainly cartilaginous, with the exception of the fleshy lobule. The external auditory meatus is an S-shaped canal. The outer third of the canal is lined with cartilage and the inner two thirds by temporal bone. The tympanic membrane separates the middle ear from the external ear. The tympanic membrane is a sheet of connective tissue that can be seen on otoscopy. The middle ear's role is to transmit and amplify vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. It contains the smallest bones of the body, malleus, incus and stapes. These bones, known as the ossicles, connect the tympanic membrane to the oval window of the cochlea. The movement of the ossicles can be partially restricted by the tensor tympani and stapedius muscles, which both contract in response to loud noises and excess vibration to prevent damage to the structures of the inner ear. Tensor tympani is innervated by a branch of the mandibular nerve and stapedius is innervated by a branch of the facial nerve. There are many important structures surrounding the middle ear. Superiorly, the brain can be found separated by the petrous part of the temporal bone. Therefore, fractures of the cranial floor can allow the middle ear to communicate with the brain and lead to severe infection like meningitis or brain abscesses. Inferiorly, the internal jugular vein is found. Laterally, there's the tympanic membrane. Medially, there's the facial nerve, which can therefore be affected in otitis media. Anteriorly, there is a thin plate of bone with an opening for the eustachian tube, separating middle ear from the internal carotid artery. The eustachian tube connects middle ear to the nasopharynx, and its role is to equalise the pressure between the middle ear and the atmosphere and prevent tympanic membrane rupture. In children, the eustachian tube is narrow and horizontal, so children are more prone to middle ear infections, that is, otitis media. The mastoid air cells sit posteriorly to the middle ear, separated from it by a thin layer of bone, although there is a small opening superiorly, allowing communication between the two areas. The mastoid air cells are a collection of air-filled spaces in the mastoid process of the temporal bone. The inner ear is responsible for converting vibrations into nerve signals so the brain can interpret the sounds and it also helps with balance. The inner ear has two main components the vestibular apparatus and the cochlea. The cochlea converts vibrations on the oval window into action potentials, which are perceived as sound. The vibrations on the oval window causes movements of fluid in the cochlea and movement of stereocilia to generate action potentials. Signals are sent to the primary auditory cortex to make sense of the input via the vestibular cochlear nerve, that is cranial nerve 8. The vestibular apparatus is involved in maintaining our balance and sense of position. It's made up of the semicircular ducts, the saccule, and utricle. The semicircular canals are filled with fluid called endolymph, which moves when the head moves, stimulating stereocilia and sending signals to the brain to interpret the position of the head by the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now let's move on to some pathologies of the ear. Otitis externa, also known as swimmer's ear, is an infection of the external auditory meatus with bacteria such as Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus aureus or fungi such as Aspergillus and Candida. Patients may present with otalgia and otorrhea. Otitis externa is a clinical diagnosis. However, consider taking an ear swab to determine the causative organism if medical management fails, condition is severe, or if otitis externa is recurrent or chronic. First-line management for acute otitis externa is microsuction of debris in the ear canal 
and simple analgesia like paracetamol or ibuprofen. If this is insufficient, then consider prescribing a topical antibiotic like acetic acid 2% spray with or without a topical corticosteroid for at least seven days. You can also give the patient self-care advice to prevent future infections and aid recovery, such as not using cotton buds to clean the ear, professional removal of earwax if this is a problem, using earplugs when swimming, and trying to get chronic skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis under control. Otitis externa can lead to complications such as malignant otitis externa. Patients with diabetes or immunocompromise are at an increased risk of this complication. In malignant otitis externa, the infection invades bone and causes osteomyelitis. Trauma to the ear resulting in pinna hematoma can become an ear deformity known as cauliflower ear if it's not urgently drained and compressed to prevent reaccumulation of blood. Deformity occurs because cartilage depends on overlying perichondrium for nutrients to maintain its cells. However, in pinna hematomas, blood collects between the cartilage and the perichondrium starving the cartilage of oxygen and leading to cell death and cartilage necrosis. Now let's move on to pathologies of the middle ear. Otitis media is infection of the middle ear with pathogens that commonly affect the respiratory regions, such as influenza virus, Haemophilus influenza, or Staphylococcus pneumoniae. Most cases are viral, however. Patients may present with otalgia, fever, and conductive hearing loss. In younger children, they may appear unwell, difficult to settle and pull on one ear. On otoscopy, there will be a bulging red tympanic membrane. To manage otitis media, you may decide to manage conservatively, as in most cases, it is self-resolving. 60% of cases of otitis media will improve within 24 hours without antibiotics. You can consider giving a delayed prescription for oral amoxicillin. Optimize analgesia. Antibiotic and steroid combination drops such as otomize may also be used. Complications of otitis media include perforated eardrum, mastoiditis, which pushes the ear forward, causes fever and swelling over the mastoid and sepsis, Bell's palsy due to involvement of the facial nerve, meningitis and brain abscesses. In acute suppurative otitis media, the patient will present with a history of gradually worsening ear pain or ear tugging in children with sudden appearance of discharge preceded by a popping sensation. On otoscopy, there may be mucopyrulent watery discharge in the ear canal and perforation of the tympanic membrane seen. It is managed in the same way as acute otitis media. Otitis media with effusion, also known as glue ear, is common in children due to the horizontal eustachian tube limiting drainage of the middle ear. Patients will present with conductive hearing loss, poor speech development, and otalgia. On otoscopy, you will see a retracted straw-coloured tympanic membrane. It's useful to request a tympanogram and pure tone audiogram. Otitis media with effusion is usually self-limiting and resolves within three months. Provide the patient and their parents or guardians with verbal and written advice about glue ear and advice on how to minimise the impact of hearing loss. For example, send a letter to the school requesting the child sit at the front of the class. In cases of recurrent bilateral otitis media with effusion, then surgical intervention, that is, the insertion of grommets, may be appropriate. Hearing aids may also be considered. Unilateral glue in an adult is worrying and should warrant further investigations as it could be a sign of nasopharyngeal malignancy. Cholesteatoma is a non-cancerous growth of squamous epithelium that is behind the attic of the tympanic membrane. Patients present with conductive hearing loss, foul-smelling persistent otorrhea, as well as possibly vertigo or facial nerve palsy. They will not complain of any pain. On otoscopy, there will be a brown irregular mass at the upper attic of the tympanic membrane. It's a surgical emergency as it invades surrounding tissue and bone like the mastoid bone, and there is a high rate of recurrence. Complications of the surgical procedure to remove the cholesteatoma include hyperacusis, vertigo, tinnitus, loss of taste and hearing loss. Otosclerosis refers to a gradual fusion of the stapes of the middle ear to the oval window, leading to gradual conductive hearing loss and tinnitus. Risk factors for otosclerosis include family history and pregnancy. Treatment is with stapidectomy and insertion of a prosthesis, 
or hearing aids if bilateral deafness. Vertigo refers to a sensation of movement when stationary. Patients may feel unsteady and nauseous. Dizziness without sensation of movement is not vertigo. It may be due to cardiovascular causes such as arrhythmias or postural hypotension, blood pressure medications, anxiety or intoxication, among other causes. One cause of vertigo is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, where crystals in the semicircular canals move when the patient turns their head, stimulating stereocilia inappropriately. Patients present with intermittent bursts of vertigo. They do not have any hearing loss or tinnitus. You can perform the Dix Hall Pike test to confirm the diagnosis. Torsional nystagmus in the examination is indicative of BPPV. BPPV can be managed by regularly performing the Epley's maneuver. Vestibular neuritis is another cause of vertigo, and it refers to inflammation of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Patients will present with acute onset of severe vertigo, vomiting, diarrhea without any hearing loss or tinnitus. It is self resolving, although bed rest may be necessary, and it would be sensible for the patient to avoid driving, especially when they're dizzy. Labyrinthitis is a rare infection of the inner ear causing vertigo and permanent sensorineural hearing loss and or tinnitus. On examination, the patient will have horizontal nystagmus, sensorineural hearing loss and an impaired vestibular ocular reflex. It's a self-resolving infection, so management may just include conservative management. Advice including avoiding driving, resting during periods of vertigo, and short-term prochlorperazine for severe episodes. Hearing loss can be classified as either sensorineural or conductive. Sensorineural indicates a problem with the nerve. Therefore, it will be caused by pathologies involving the inner ear or cranial nerve 8, for example, acoustic neuroma or Meniere's disease. Conductive indicates a problem with the sound getting to the nerve. Therefore, it will be caused by pathologies involving the middle or external ear for example, earwax, otitis media, or externa. You can differentiate between the two by Rinne's and Weber's tuning fork tests. In a conductive hearing loss, Weber's will lateralize to the affected ear and Rinne's will show bone conduction is better than air conduction. In a sensorineural hearing loss, Weber's will lateralize to the unaffected ear and Rinne's will show air conduction is better than bone conduction although the air conduction isn't as loud as it is in the unaffected ear. Acoustic neuroma is a benign mass of Schwann cells that can cause a patient to have unilateral sensorineural hearing loss, vertigo, tinnitus and an absent corneal reflex. Important investigations to be done include MRI of the cerebellopontine angle and audiometry. Management is either with conservative management, surgery or radiotherapy. Drugs like cisplatin, gentamicin or feruzamide can also cause sensorineural hearing loss. Meniere's disease is a disease of unknown etiology that causes a buildup of endolymph within the membranous labyrinth of the inner ear. Patients present with recurrent episodes of unilateral sensorineural hearing loss, vertigo, oral fullness and tinnitus in association with vomiting and diarrhea. On examination, the patient will have rotational vertigo and a positive Romberg's test. Buccal or intramuscular prochlorperazine can be given in acute attacks and beta histine and vestibular rehabilitation exercises can be used for prevention of attacks. The patient should inform the DVLA about their condition and will need to avoid driving until symptom control is achieved. Thanks for watching.